What a lovely evening. What a pleasure to be here. You are extraordinarily clever, and I know you're extraordinarily clever. In fact, the title of my talk shouldn't be called Summer Winter Problem. It should be called Extraordinarily Clever Folks Out There Who Are Watching Me, okay? <laughs> I'm going to test you and see how extraordinarily clever you are. So here's the start. I'm going to tell you a story, and the story is going to be one about an auditorium that was built at MIT about 1953. Its designer, Eero Saarinen, did a particularly clever job. You can see that it looks a bit like a piece of an eggshell, and it's resting on three points. Well, to build an auditorium on three points is already a major feat. But the interesting part of the story is that next door to the auditorium, the MIT engineers put an ice skating rink. Now, wait a minute, an ice skating rink next to an auditorium. Why would you put an ice skating rink next to an auditorium? It seems very strange. Well, it turns out that a good way to heat the auditorium is to have an ice skating rink next door. Now, I can see your wheels turning. You're thinking, ah, oh, yes, crank, 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 yes, aha. Something is amiss. How can an ice skating rink possibly heat an auditorium? Well, I can see some glimmers of light here and there, and you're right. What's happening, of course, is that you extract the heat from the ice, and you use that extra heat to heat the auditorium. And it works. Marvelous idea. Okay, so let's think about interesting ways that you are indeed extraordinarily clever. Let's talk about another problem, which I'd, I'd call the summer-winter problem, but it's really just this. Here is the problem. Uh, is there a summer-winter problem? I mean, after all, the summer is nice and the winter is also nice for different reasons, and here I am trying to tell you it's a problem. Well, the summer is really hot, that's for sure, and the winter is really cold, that's for sure, and that's a problem. Right. I mean, after all, shouldn't we solve that problem? That should be an easy problem to solve. So why don't we just do this? It sounds like a really easy thing to do if you think about it from the point of view of a person who likes to talk about energy. And as a physics person, I love to talk about energy. But here's the deal. If I take the energy from the summer and save it, and then I use it the following winter, then it solves all sorts of problems. That's the summer-winter problem. You with me? Okay, it's a cool idea. Take the summer heat, save it. Don't let it go. Save it, and then use it the following winter to heat the buildings. Great. Well, there it is. I mean, there is good old Indiana University, and there are summer and winter, and so we ought to be able to do this. Does that violate some fundamental rule of the world? It's like conservation of energy, and the answer is no. That's just fine, as long as you save the energy and then use it the following winter. Well, all right, that sounds like a possibility. Um, conservation of energy works, physics is happy, uh, everyone should be happy, it sounds like we have a, a, a go. There's another benefit to that, and that is if you're going to do that, then you're going to also save an enormous amount of energy because you don't have to get extra energy to heat the buildings in the winter. You see, in the usual situation, you have to spend all these fossil fuels that are generating electricity to run your air conditioner in the summer. And then you have to turn around, and all winter long, you have to use more fossil fuels to heat the building. And the nice thing about solving the, the, the summer-winter problem in this nice way of just using the summer heat to, to, to warm the building in the winter is you don't have to spend all those fossil fuels. So the climate science folks, which we heard about earlier this evening, are really happy. Because then, of course, you're not burning fossil fuels, you're not melting glaciers, you're not creating droughts, and everything sounds just hunky-dory. There's another solution which is much better. Let's just move to Hawaii. <laughs> it's really cool, right? No winter! No winter! It's really, it's really great. With no winter, the summer-winter problem does not exist, and uh, th that's the, that should be the end of my talk right there. We just stop. Right, 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 right. There's one small difficulty. And that is seven billion of us all in Hawaii 
is awkward, to say the least. <laughs> One could imagine that the Hawaiians themselves would complain. Now, one doesn't know that for sure, but they might complain. All right, so that solution sounds a little iffy, so let's go back to the other solution, and that is simply saving the summer heat to use the following winter. That sounds like a better start, at least. Okay, well, think about your house. Okay, here is your house sitting there, your apartment, you're living in your house or your apartment, and um, it's a piece of cake. All you have to do is, uh, is then take the heat out of the house in the summer, save it, and then put it back into the house in the winter, and that will solve the problem. Well, you say, that sounds just fine, but there are a couple of bugs in the system that I can think of. One of the bugs, in fact, it sounds a little bit like a harebrained scheme to me. Harebrained schemes are ones that usually don't work, right? So, first, how can you possibly store a whole, a whole year's worth of heat? And second, even if you could store a whole year's worth of heat, when you came back six months later to pick it up, it's gone. So there are two problems. One is storing a huge amount of heat, and the other is imagining that it's still going to be there six months later. Are you with me? Okay. So let's be, let's be extraordinarily clever and see what happens. Well, first of all, let's worry about the problem of storing a huge amount of heat. Obviously, that uh, silly little can there is not going to store heat for you. So can you think of anything that lies around your house that's really big that might be used to store a very large amount of heat? Well, how about the ground underneath? Yeah, that's big. But, but can you store heat in the ground? The ground's cold. How could you possibly store heat in the ground? Well, it turns out that ground actually has a huge amount of what is called heat capacity, you can actually store heat in the ground pretty well. People actually do that when they're using these geothermal systems. And so actually using the ground under your apartment or house is not a crazy idea. So let's pass to the second problem. The second problem was, OK, yes, I can store a lot of heat under the ground, but if I come back six months later to use it, it's gone. Agreed? It's gone. Maybe. Do you remember the hot summer of 2012? Summer, well, there was a hot summer of 2012. For those who don't remember the hot summer of 2012, it takes extraordinary cleverness to remember that hot summer. But there you go. Okay. Okay. Hot summer of 2012, indeed, has been working its way down into the ground in Indiana. What do I mean? If you dig a hole in Indiana, you can actually go down and find the hot summer of 2012. You don't believe me, but it's true. If you go down, you will find there's a nice hot layer down there which came from the hot summer of 2012. And in fact, climate scientists, and I've been doing some climate science recently, climate scientists actually do the following. They dig a really deep hole and measure the temperatures on the side of the hole, and they can actually determine something about the past climate for several hundred years from the temperature on the side of the hole. That's impressive. And that means, actually, that the rate at which heat moves in ground is very, very slow, and that when you come back in six months' time, that heat, remarkably, very well may still be there. So let's try it out. Here is a building. This is a building from the University of Alabama. I'm sorry it's not the University of Indiana, Indiana University, but there you go. Uh, it's the Student Recreation Center, built in 1983 uh, there. And you know the rest. What they did, what they do, always, is all summer long, they air condition the building. It's a big building. They air condition the building. And how do you do that? You run an air conditioner, which is sometimes called a heat pump. You pump that heat underground. You can do that, yeah? You just pump it underground, and the ground underneath that that recreation center gets quite warm. In fact, if I were a worm, I probably wouldn't want to be under the ground at that point. point. But nevertheless, the ground gets pretty warm uh, at the end of the summer. And then the following winter, you use the heat, pull it back out of the ground to heat the building. It works. It is working. It does work. But this is Alabama, of course, and we're sitting here in Indiana. And in Indiana, it probably won't work. Too cold. Too cold. The ground in uh, Alabama is at about 70 degrees. The ground here is at about 55 degrees for you cavers. So can you store energy in the ground here? Well, 
let's be really dramatic about it and then try to, 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 to do the same thing in, in a crazy place, which is Canada. So I'm going to take you to Canada. Here's a place in Canada, which is really, really cold. And I, the, the name of the town is called Oka, Okotoks, and I can't say Okotoks more than once, so it's very hard. But Okotoks, Alberta, in Canada, is indeed a small village. And indeed, in that village, they have selected and built 50 houses, 50 houses, all of which have a garage. And on the garage, you can see that there are solar panels. These are not electric solar panels. These are just good old solar panels that are circulating a fluid, typically ethylene glycol, that circulates through the panels. Fine. So everyone has solar panels on their garage. Fine. So far, so good. What happens next? Well, what they did is that they dug a great big hole in the ground, which is a big cylinder. It's about 100 feet across and about 150 feet deep, and they filled it with dirt. Okay, so you have a big cylinder of dirt. And in that dirt, you put 140 wells. That, I didn't do that, they did that. They put 140 wells. They put the hot ethylene glycol into the well, into this big chunk of dirt, and by the end of a typical summer, by the end of a typical summer, all that solar energy then comes in and raises the temperature of that big well of Earth. And in fact, they find that it raises the temperature to about 175 degrees F. That's nearly the boiling point of water. So indeed, by a whole summer's worth of sun in Canada, and there isn't much sun in Canada, of course, whole series of sun in Canada, they can actually heat this ground up to something like 175 degrees. That's cool. That's cool, but is that sufficient to heat 50 houses for a whole winter? And it turns out that in 2012 and ever since, they've managed to heat 97% of the heat needed to heat those homes. So that's pretty cool. So, lovely folks, that is what I would call extreme or uh, at least extraordinary cleverness. However, is that the first ever occurrence of extreme cleverness? And the answer is, of course not. People have been solving the summer-winter problem in many ways for many years. I mention one person who comes to mind, and that's good old Tom Jefferson. Tom Jefferson, of course, was president of the United States. And in 1801, when he came to the White House, one of the very first things he did was to build an ice house. Oh, wait a minute, we don't do ice houses. I don't think Obama has an ice house. Do you think he has? Probably doesn't have an ice house. Well, anyway, Jefferson had an ice house. So what is an ice house? Well, he simply collected ice from the Potomac River in the winter, put it then into this house, stacked it with straw, and then more ice, more straw, more ice, and then he had ice to put in people's drinks the following summer, I suppose, or whatever it is you do with ice in the summer. You keep your drinks cool. But it is an example of how you solve the summer-winter problem. In his case, he's solving it in reverse. He's taking the cold in the winter and using it, indeed, to provide cold the following summer. Well, then he went on, and he, in 1802, the next year, he decided to put a, an ice house in Monticello, and he did, and there is the ice coming into the ice house there. So that is, that is, is all very clever. I guess in summary, lovely folks, what I'd like to do is to, is to congratulate you on being extraordinarily clever in every sense of the word. It is amazing how powerful your mind is and how many things you can do to solve interesting problems. If you think about interesting problems lying around, we old folks have left you lots of interesting problems. <laughs> lots, of, <laughs> lots of really hard problems, too. But some of those problems are not actually so terrible. And actually, if you think about two things, it kind of helps to, to get your hands on interesting problems. One thing to keep in mind is huge resources that are not being used. And another thing to keep in mind is waste. Think about the Sahara Desert for a moment. Can you imagine all the solar energy that's going into the Sahara Desert that's completely wasted? Yeah, it's there. You're there. I mean, could you use that? Well, indeed, there are all sorts of cool ideas. Another, of course, is waste. If you look at Indiana University, we're not a wasteful organization at all, but you could imagine that there might be a case where you could find all sorts of places where we waste energy and other resources here. Lovely folks, you are ingenious and clever, and thank you very much.